Thank you, Mike. Uh, appreciate the organizers of this conference. Uh, it's uh, coming a long way since we met in Huntsville, and uh, uh, I look forward to kind of updating you on some of the information about nurseries and. And I, I appreciate the collaboration theme that I hear in this group, and uh, I think we definitely need that. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's refreshing to see government and private and, and cons conservation groups and everybody kind of coming together and, uh, and, and even cross government agencies actually communicating with each other. So that's, that's good. <laughs> Makes, makes me uh, proud of my tax dollars there. So, um. <laughs> Well, it, for the ones of you that aren't familiar with our company, uh, we go, a lot of us call, uh, call it IFCO now. We used to be International Forest Seed Company. Uh, we took the seed out, but a, a lot of people still remember that, so I... I'll answer for that too, but uh, we've been uh, doing containerized seedlings for 32 years now, and in uh, this uh, year we're producing over 84 million uh, seedlings in uh, a variety of species, loblolly, uh, slash, longleaf, shortleaf, Virginia pine, and we also do some native plants and wiregrass, and it's found in the longleaf ecosystem, and and some other natives, and maybe there's going to be some in the short leaf ecosystem that uh, people are looking at as well. This is a tool that we use when somebody calls you up and says, "Look, you know, I've decided I'm going, I need to plant some trees," or and uh, and we start out at the basis uh, basics of this, and you've heard some of this at the bottom of that pyramid is the market. You know, I start asking people, well, what, what are you trying to produce and what value is on your piece of the land? You know, and sometimes it's not always economic value. It may be the fact that somebody enjoys hunting quail or shooting deer as a value, but there's a variety of, of tree values out there from people that may be selling wood for saw timber, pulp wood, they may be selling it for pellets. They may be selling it for biomass. Uh, they may be selling it for poles. So, you know, what, what options is, is a landowner got? And, and, uh, and I think there's a variety of things there. And, and you even get on out there and what, what values people say, well, the oil lease on my land is more valuable than anything else. You know, the trees are just there to hold it together. So, you know, but, so you have to find out. And, and things like pine straw, which used to be no value. You know, I've got customers now that are getting $300 an acre for pine straw. So, you know, that's a, that's a huge thing. And uh, I was talking with Bill there sitting beside me. Maybe one day we're going to get paid for water. Uh, you know, we, we don't know. I think we're offering some things there. Next thing up is climate. Where, where are you uh, climatically? What's your temperatures? Uh, what's your rainfall? What's your growing season? Are you in the Piedmont? Are you in the coastal plain? Uh, uh, then, you know, are you in drought prone areas? Uh, those all will affect how you start your operation. And probably the least understood thing that we got, I think, in land management is, is soils. Uh, we've got a lot of people that looked at it, but in forestry, I don't think it's been necessarily stressed enough, but you know, what's, what's your limitations? Is it nutrients? Um, is it water holding capacity? Is it some physical characteristics of your, your uh, soils that make you have to do something differently or manage around that? Next thing up is silviculture. You know, what, what are you going to do out there to manage what you've got and to grow trees? The number one question we get in the nursery business is, how many trees do I plant to the acre? Well, that depends on all those things down below. You know, we've got a big range of that now. And uh, uh, Bill, with FIA data, they're saying they're finding a big range. Well, 
we're finding that too. We got people that want to plant 300 trees. We got people that want to plant 600. So that's a that's a big difference. Um, and and I think you know your competition control comes in there. How are you going to uh, eliminate the things that hold back your tree growth? One of my favorite sayings, my friends, some of them in the herbicide business, are you in the killing business or the growing business? Uh, I'm in the growing business, so I want my target plant to live. Uh, so, you know, and, and I think that's, that's key. And then last uh, but not least is, you know, what's your genetic pool? And we have had the speaker right before lunch talk about some of the genetic pool out there. We don't know as much about short leaf pine as we probably like to, but there are some different sources available and, and you, you, need to, you need to be noting where the seedling source was and you may see some differences that, uh, you know, the presentation there before me, you know, talked about there could be some implications from seed sources. And, you know, one last statement on this, if it pays, it stays. That's kind of what my dad told me when I got out of high school. If you pay, you stay. If you don't, you're going to go to work. So I think that's what the, ultimately the landowners got to, got to have something to, to make uh, a choice with. Well, we don't come up with all this information on our own. We're a part of seven different research co-ops. Uh, very few of these folks are interested in short leaf pine, I'll tell you. So sometimes we're sort of the lone voice at the table when we bring up something like short leaf or long leaf pine even. But uh, tree improvement co-ops, silvicultural co-ops, uh, and nursery co-ops, pest management co-op, all of those things contribute to our base of knowledge. If you haven't seen a container nursery, this is what ours looks like and we we grow under pivot irrigation uh, each pivot has about four mil million seedlings under it and uh, that's how we distribute our our water our nutrition and and manage our crop uh, we do some some insecticides and herbicides through a tractor operation we don't do it through the watering system but we have uh, this operations at Moultrie, Georgia, southwest Georgia. We also have one down in southern Florida, and we have one in, in uh, western Louisiana. And, you know, this is short leaf production. I just took this picture a couple of weeks ago and uh, shows, you know, a whole area of short leaf seedling. So it's something that uh, we're, we're pretty heavy into is, is relationship to some things but here's uh, here's some uh, short leaf numbers that's uh, come through the Auburn co-op that uh, to give you an idea of what per production of short leaf seedlings is like across the south you see it up and down uh, 2008 there was only about 2 million then it jumped up to to almost 4 million in 2009. I don't know all the reasons, but a large driver of this is the U.S. Forest Service. They're, they're planting more short leaf than anybody, and, and that's going primarily into Arkansas, but they also plant some in um, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas as well. So, uh, And I, I think they also plant some maybe in the Carolina, South Carolina, or possibly North Carolina. But, you know, it, it ranged from, you know, a low of about 2 million up to 4 million over that period of time. So that's, that's what's been produced. And this includes bare root and container. Now, here's our graph, uh, and I, it's got a little different time frame, goes from 2008 up to 15. But uh, as you can see, our production certainly reflects those southwide productions. We had one of our biggest years in 2009 as well, but over two million seedlings. So we're, we're growing anywhere from 40 to 60% of the seedlings of short leaf that are put out there in the landscape now. Well, what's driving 
using container sealings. The uh, previous speaker uh, talked about that. Certainly seeing some survival differences. Um, I think the other thing is planting windows. Uh, when you go out and have to get uh, contractors to do this kind of work, you need, you need as big a window to operate in as you can. You know, container seedlings can be planted uh, from October through April if, if you make plans for that, as long as you've got soil moisture. Um, also, we're seeing some uh, increased growth through container seedlings. And uh, I'll talk about some of our sizes, the containers that we use in production. And, and I think the overall trend is, is to lower the initial trees uh, per acre. And this is for a number of reasons. Some of it is to increase the saw timber potential on a, a site by not having too many trees to the acre. And the other one is some, for some wildlife reasons. You're trying to get sunlight to the, to the ground. Uh, so uh, those are things there. And then, then the container seedlings, uh, you know, as we talked about, maybe there's a limited amount of seed out there. You want to utilize that seed to your uh, best efficiency, and container seedlings usually will give you a higher efficiency than, than bare root just because we control more of the variables. Um, what is a target seedling that we're after? Uh, we're, we're looking at a height of 10 to 12 inches, uh, root collar diameter, this is in, in millimeters, four millimeters right here at the ground line. You see this characteristic crook, I'll talk a little bit about that in a, a little more, but the, we want a root shoot ratio of uh, 0.40 or greater by dry weight. Uh, we want a firm root system in we grow root volume. We, we don't want anything less than five and a half cubic inches, but uh, we can go up to you know seven or so and, and still keep our cost in line. This is some things that uh, I guess I'm concerned about to some extent. We've heard the, the characteristic crook here in this seedling and uh, when I first started growing I thought I was going to have a revolt for my nursery manager. He said, you done bought some sorry seed. And he said, uh, all the trees are crooked out here. And I said, well I don't know about that. So I got to checking with a guy named uh, Finus Harris with the Forest Service and Finus said, no, no, that's, that's a good thing. He said, so it's a, a, a short leaf. And, but you do see a lot of straight trees in there too, and that, that's a concern, you know, is that a hybrid or not? And some people say it is. I guess we're, we're hoping to, to figure that out as we go forward and know for sure. Uh, the different containers that we grow in, uh, we got the one that's on the table out there is what we call a 120S. It's got 49 seedlings a square feet. Uh, 3.4 inches in length, 1.6 diameter. Uh, we also have one that's a, a 135, and I think that's the one probably David was talking about. It's 53 per square foot, 5 inches in length, 1.6 inches. And we've got one that's uh, specific to us. We call it 128, and it's uh, 51 per square foot, 51.5, 4.75 in the length, I mean, uh, of the diameter of uh, 1.5. Uh, and it, we like that container the best of anything because it's got side air pruning on it. Uh, seedlings are packaged 300 to the box. We have no more than five coals per box. Uh, no pest or disease, anything. We put a liner in our boxes and uh, we want a fully developed root system with mycorrhiza that holds that root system together. <clears throat> Here's some data that uh, Auburn has uh, generated on container seedlings in general. This is not short leaf specific as loblolly pine, but here's some of the differences you see with, with bare root. And I'm not trying to throw bare root under the, the, the bus here, it's just the, the accurate data, but the uh, you, you look at the total number of, of roots uh, 
and, and this is after five months in some growing containers, and you got 20 coming with bare root, if you look down at these different container sizes here, you know, you're talking about triple the number of, of roots, and that's a, that's a, that adds to survival and growth too. And you'd same thing with root weight. Most of the root weight is double in container seedlings, and roots is what you need to get trees to grow. Shows you a package of uh, seedlings and what they'll look like. Uh, you'll have uh, uh, those laid in the box and uh, the liner, you see the liner around it, and that, that'll be closed up, and those are packaged that way. And what do we do for seed sources? Currently, this is what we're doing. All of our seedlings are produced from genetically improved sources, and we're starting to have a limited amount of OP, and this, this is open pollinated known mother tree uh, sources available. And uh, we'll have some of those this next year. And uh, seed sources that we've gotten is from uh, Virginia, Orchards, North Carolina Orchards, Georgia Orchards, Arkansas, and Texas. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any more seed sources other than the Forest Service from that, so, but we've tried to diversify and we try to put seedlings back as close as possible. But I'm gonna tell you why that's important to plan. Uh, this, is, this is a one year old seedling uh, you don't see something, I don't know the exact height, but that looks maybe about 14, 15 inches out there. What should that be? Well, you can see there's pretty good competition control around that. Uh, and I don't know that we know that answer yet. I, I'm not even sure that most people know what it is, should be in loblolly pine. That I've been convinced of that, or longleaf pine. Uh, we, one thing that we definitely have seen in the pines is some adverse effects from herbicide being applied too late in the process and stunning the trees. And uh, I'm not against herbicides because they're a wonderful tool, but you've got to be careful. Uh, and I'm saying that that tree probably ought to be uh, two and a half to three feet tall after a year if it's got what it needs. But you know, again, soils, everything else contribute to that. If you don't have the nutrition there, it may not be able to grow either. These are some three-year-old seedlings, uh, U.S. Forest Service up in, uh, in Arkansas. And uh, so, you know, pretty decent growth. Uh, this was very little competition control on those trees too. So, but uh, that's, that's the kind of things that we look at. Uh, certainly people say, well, what's the cost of this? And I put it in, if you notice price per acre, not in dollars per thousand, because that's where people you typically say, but you really, you, your cost is what your cost per acre is, because you can go 300 trees or you can go 600 and you're going to have a different cost. This is based on 500 trees an acre. Your containerized is going to cost you about 7250 the bare root improved is going to be about $30, so you're a little over two times the cost for containerized. But again, it's not the cost of the ingredients, it's the uh, taste of the pie. <laughs> uh, keys to being successful. Uh, and I've got some customers in this room, I think they'll tell you that too. Uh, this has changed. Order seedlings by January 31st for the planting season that next fall or winter. You, you're probably saying, my gosh, I'm worried about a lot of things in January other than buying seedlings for the next year, and I have no idea what I'm going to plant. Well, if we don't start preparing this seed, we won't have it ready to sow in the nursery. And Nobody in the nursery business is going to speculate with millions of short leaf. So if you want it, you're going to have to give us some guidance. But we got all of us in the nursery business have got some flexibility to work with you. We're not going to try to make you take stuff you, you don't need. But, but if we know a general idea of where you're going, then we're taking less risk. 
I'd say no and keep up with the seed source you plant. You know, you may say, hey, I like this nursery, I like this seed source, but if you don't keep up with it, you, you don't know why, why those perform better than something else. Plant seedlings early and deep to ensure good survival. Uh, I think uh, the earlier you can get them in the ground, the more root growth you get before you get to spring. Now, if you get pretty far north, you're going to have to be a little sensitive to that. You can't go out and put them right ahead of a, a severe freeze and expect them to, to tolerate it because they, they won't. But, and the other thing is, is all the data that I've seen on planting is plant them deep. I've heard some talk about keeping that crook up at the ground level, but that doesn't seem to be important for what we've seen with data for that. But that's my opinion. Uh, do your chemical site prep in June through early August. Now, if you go talk to a chemical company or contractor, they'll, they'll push you right on out to November if you'll let them. Well, you're taking a big risk that your chemical is not going to dissipate. And, uh, and we're seeing that more and more. And the pressure when we go into times like that where timber harvest is increased, the private landowners particularly are pushed to the last of the and they, they may not have the option. So, but if you can plan with a, a chemical guy, he loves to spray in, in early summer, but you got to cut your timber and everything and be ready to do that. But this thing right here at the bottom, planning is essential. It's not just, you know, I hope to do it, but you gotta be there. And here's our theme. Not all seedlings are created equal. And, uh, I'll be glad to talk to any of you at, uh, and uh, try to answer any questions if you got any.